next up next is um dk chukumiri j who is going to be giving us a presentation but before he comes up um, i'm just going to do a brief introduction about him he is a nigerian spoken word and performance poetry artist and an award-winning author he has eight published books to his name including the novel Orichindere, which won the 2013 Association of Nigerian Authors Prize for Prose Fiction and a Poetry Theatre Production. He is a member of the vibrant literary, Abuja Literary Society and the host of the group's Book Jam and Poetry Slam. He has won several poetry grand slams in Nigeria, including the maiden edition of the African Poets Grand Slam competition. Since 2013, he has hosted and directed the annual Night of the Spoken Word Performance Poetry event as part of a movement to insert performance poetry into Nigeria's mainstream pop culture. DK is one of Nigeria's most prolific performance poets with successful poetry videos, a poetry show and theater production, the Made in Nigeria Poetry Show that has been successfully staged seven times. His shows are now among the most anticipated events in Abuja, creatively fusing entertainment and a call for reawakening of our national consciousness. Please, a big round of applause for DK Chukumeriji. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I want to talk about uh, Nigeria in a different sort of way. Um, the River Niger is an enigmatic river. It was, it's born in the uh, highlands of Guinea-Conakry. It's born a few short kilometers from the Atlantic Ocean. Typically, rivers flow to the sea. Typically, rivers flow south. But the River Niger is one of those rivers of the world that breaks these conventions and begins its life by flowing away from the sea. It begins its life by flowing north towards the Sahara Desert, where it then makes a U-turn at the edge of the Sahara Desert and follows a long winding path to the sea. So the River Niger is shaped like a very loose U. The unconventional path the River Niger chooses to take is the driving force for West African civilization. Because if you study the history of this region, you see that so many of the iconic pre-colonial West African states developed in or around the River Niger basin. So the River Niger has had the same civilizational impact in this region as the Nile has had in North Africa, or the Zambezi in South Africa, or the Tigris and Euphrates in the Middle East, or the Yangtze in China, or the Tiber in Europe. Because everywhere in the world, great rivers tend to give birth to great nations. And it is not different here in West Africa. The River Niger is the live wire, is the life of West African civilization. And that is the river that Nigeria is named after. And for good reason too, because that river has very deep connections to the area that is today Nigeria. Here in Nigeria, the river Niger gathers to itself a great number of tributaries. A tributary is a river that flows into another river. So almost all our rivers in Nigeria, from north to south, east to west, Christian or Muslim, almost all our rivers in Nigeria from river Sokoto in the northwest to river Mambala in the southeast, from River Focados in the south, south to River Gongula in the northeast, almost all our rivers connect to the River Niger. It is also here in Nigeria that the River Niger meets its greatest tributary, and that's the River Benue. It is also here in Nigeria that the River Niger, after its long epic journey from Guinea, it is here in Nigeria that the River Niger finally meets the Atlantic Ocean. And that is the river Nigeria is named after a river that is characterized by the unconventional path it takes, a river that is characterized by the great impact it has on civilization and culture in this region, and a river that is characterized by the great number of other rivers it draws to itself. That is the river Nigeria is named for, a river that is characterized by its unconventionality, or if you like, its creativity, by its impact, and by the shared diversity of rivers it gathers to itself, that is the river Nigeria is named after. 
And in African culture and mythology, naming always has some spiritual significance. We believe that a person, a name, connects the person named to the energy of the person or thing or event for which he or she is named. So within the African worldview, we don't think it is abnormal to see a person begin to exhibit the characteristics of that person, event or thing for which that person is named. So in this context, it is not surprising to see Nigeria exhibiting some of the characteristics of the River Niger. It is not surprising to see Nigerians exhibiting such high levels of unconventionality, or if you like, creativity. It is not surprising to see Nigerian movies and music and art having such impact on regional, continental, and global culture. It is not surprising to see Nigeria gathering within itself such a vast array of peoples, languages, and cultures, just like the River Niger. It is not surprising to see Nigeria displaying high levels of creativity, impact, and diversity. And these concepts, creativity, impact, diversity, geography, they are not random, they are intricately linked. You see, our impact on the global stage, that soft power we have, the wave that Nigerian culture makes, our impact on the global stage is driven by our creativity. Our creativity in turn is driven by our diversity and our diversity is rooted in our geography. You see, we exist in a geographical location that is conducive to the flourishing of diversity and the manifestation of high levels of creativity. Do you know why? It is because we exist at a crossroad. We exist at that junction where North, West and Central Africa meet. We exist at that junction where West Africa's longest river meets with its greatest tributary. And you see, rivers are also roads. Rivers are also trade and travel routes. So we exist at that junction where several trade and travel routes meet. Nigeria exists at a natural crossroad. This is a geographical fact that precedes Lord Lugard. It precedes Flora Shaw. It precedes Usman Danfudu. It precedes Jaja of Opobo. It precedes Kotal Kanta. It precedes Iwari the Great. It precedes Ezenri. It precedes Odudua. From time immemorial, the area that is today Nigeria has always sat at a natural crossroad. And wherever you find a crossroad, Wherever you find a place where different roads meet, wherever you find a place where people and ideas, languages and cultures, goods and services are free to interact, intersect and intermingle, there you'll find a melting pot. There you'll find a flourishing diversity. There you'll find the manifestation of some of the highest levels of creativity possible to the human spirit. Because diversity, is a natural driver of human creativity. And that is why this area that is today Nigeria, sitting as it does on a natural crossroad, has always through history been the scene of some of the most ingenious expressions of creativity in art, culture, and political engineering. No be today. It is not a fluke that the earliest known sophisticated civilization in sub-Saharan Africa arose here, the Nok civilization, near that junction between the Niger and the Benue, is not a fluke. It is not a fluke that so many of the iconic, innovative, multicultural states of pre-colonial West Africa, so many of them from Kanem-Borono to Benin, from the Alsa city states to Oyo, as so many of them congregate in this area that is today Nigeria, it is no fluke. From the ancient iron smelting furnaces of Onsoka to the fine terracotta sculptures of ancient Kaduna, from the bronze working civilization of Ibo to the lost cast wax techniques of Benin and Ife, this geographical location through history 
has always been conducive to the flourishing of creativity. It is a geographical fact that precedes Bobby Benson. It precedes Fela. It precedes the Mandators. It precedes Burner. Because wherever you find a crossroad, wherever you find a place where peoples and cultures, languages and values, goods and services can interact, intersect, and intermingle freely, there you will find a melting pot. There you will find a flourishing diversity, and there you will find some of the greatest expressions of creativity possible to the human spirit, because diversity is a natural driver of creativity. And that is why some of the, the two most fundamental assets we possess as a modern nation today is one, our geographical location, and two, our diversity. But you see, in this life, it is not strange for your greatest strength and your greatest weakness to be two sides of the same coin. This is not strange at all. And that is why you will discover that the same geographical location that makes us a natural crossroad and has served us so well through history is the same geographical location that made us so vulnerable to all the slave trades that afflicted the African continent. Nigeria is the only country, or one of the few, I think it's the only one, but I'm, I'm still to verify, where all the three historic slave trades passed through Nigeria because of our location particularly the most recent one, the transatlantic slave trade with its devastating impact on the psyche of the modern African. Likewise, the same diversity that makes us so inspiring in some areas is the same diversity that makes us so uninspiring in others. The same diversity that makes us so ingenious when it comes to art, sports, business, is the same diversity that makes us so problematic when it comes to civic engagement, to electioneering, to voting, to the mechanics of putting a competent government in place. The same diversity that lifts us up when it comes to creative entrepreneurship is the same diversity that drags us down when it comes to politics. You see, diversity is both a blessing and a curse. The blessing enhanced creativity. The curse enhanced difficulty in getting people of different tribes and tongues to see eye to eye. Diversity is our greatest asset and diversity is our greatest liability. And that is why the most critical question we must answer in order to unlock our future as a nation is how do we manage our diversity effectively? Anyone who has no real answer to that question cannot lead this nation into its full potential. Because at its core, development is not about building roads and bridges. At its core, development is not about tinkering with macroeconomic policy. At its core, development is about crafting a narrative that allows a group of disorganized people to unlock the potential in their collectiveness. That's what development is at its core. And our history as a nation has already gifted us with the beginnings of that narrative. Now, I know that all of us here were raised to study our history with the eye for spotting difference. But if you rearrange your brain, and begin to study our history with the eye for spotting connections, you will see that our history has already gifted us with the key for managing our diversity effectively. And what is that key? That key is found in three broad principles that are personified by the three principal statesmen that negotiated the independence of this modern nation. And what are these three broad principles for managing our diversity effectively? One, the principle of respect. We must always approach our ethno-religious differences with respect. 
the fact that I do not talk like you or look like you or dress like you or eat like you or worship like you does not mean that I'm inferior to you. You must never assume that your cultural ways are in and of themselves better than my cultural ways. And I must not assume that my religious practices are in and of themselves better than your religious practices. If it matters to you, then for that reason, it should matter to me. And if it matters to me, then for that reason, it should matter to you. The things that we hold as precious as individuals must never be casually brushed aside in any conversation about our shared future. This is what the Sedauna Sahamadubelu meant when he responded to Zeke, who is reported to have said to him, let's forget our differences. And to this, the Sedauna responded and said, no, let us understand our differences. For understanding is the root of respect. Number one, the principle of respect. Number two, the principle of autonomy. We must give our differences space to breathe. That means that I must have a space that I can, to the most part, arrange as I want. And you must have a space that you can, to the most part, arrange as you want. Our society does not have to be a monologue. Our society does not have to be one song, one color, one dress, one tribe, one religion, one way of doing things. No, our society should reflect the natural world around us where diverse ecosystems and life forms come together to make life possible on this blue planet. Like this, we must evolve a system that does not automatically penalize anybody simply because he or she comes from a different tribe or religion. Like this, we must evolve a system that allows all flowers the space they need to bloom. This is why Chief Obafemi Awolowo, all his life was an advocate for a federal system of government, for a system of government in which every identity group would have some type of autonomy at some level of society. This is why he was a lifelong advocate for federalism, for a system of government that would allow our differences, the space we all need to breathe. Number two, the principle of autonomy. Number three, the principle of convergence. No matter how diverse we are, we must have points of convergence. No matter how different we are, we must have a basic set of issues, values, and perspectives that bring us together. Because ultimately, underneath our ethnocultural differences, we share the same geographical space. We share the same socioeconomic realities. We share the same basic humanity. For when all is said and done, the hunger, of a poor homeless boy in Meduguri is no different from the hunger of a poor homeless boy in Lagos. When all is said and done, the pain of living in a society where the rights of the minority and the non-indigen are not respected, that pain is as sharp for a Muslim woman trying to make a home in Enugu as it is for a Christian man trying to make a home in Katsina. When all is said and done, the bullets and extremist fire will not ask you, are you a Christian? Or are you a Muslim before piercing through your heart? We have so many problems we share in common and we cannot afford to discriminate between ourselves, amongst ourselves, when trying to evolve solutions to these shared problems. This is what Dr. Nam Diazikiwe meant when he said that there must be a set of laws to which all Nigerians are subject and a body of rights to which all Nigerians are entitled. These three principles, the principle of respect, the principle of autonomy, and the principle of convergence, together constitute the ideology behind the concept of one Nigeria. This is what one Nigeria means as originally conceived by our founding fathers, to build a nation bound, not in oppression, not in chains, but in freedom. This is the ideology that will allow us to manifest cultural pride without degenerating into tribalism. This is the ideology that will allow us to express our ethnocultural differences without losing the capacity for collective action as one black nation. 
This is the ideology that will allow us to remain diverse, fiercely and proudly so, without losing the huge benefit of standing together as one African people at this remarkable crossroad on the African continent, where West Africa's longest river finally meets the sea. I tell you, it is a blessing to be member, to be the member of an ethnic group that is indigenous to this geographical location, because this geography has gifted all of us who are indigenous to it with a capacity to conquer at the world stage. But all we need to realize that potential is to master these principles for managing our diversity successfully. Now, permit me to end this presentation with a very short poem inspired by the Nigerian coat of arms and titled The Nigerian Dream. It is because our earth is rich and yields its wealth to those who touch its soil with love and discipline. That is why our flag is green. Because we see the eagle rise above the dark and stormy skies. It serves to remind us all of the benefits of standing tall. Because the horse will show no fear. The day that war is drawing near, it shows how for our dignity, we too must fight courageously. Because the lines of tribe and tongue are not the lines of right and wrong. Our rivers both meet peacefully to give us faith in unity. These are the dreams we had at dawn, the hopes that saw our nation born, ideals that slumber deep within the colors of the green, white, green, the lofty heights that history saw, the future that it reached out for, the proof that they believed that we could someday be a great country. It is because we have this chance to make and mold our circumstance, to stretch and touch that distant height. That is why our flag is white. Thank you. Take, Take action. action. Join, Join the, the movement, movement and visit, visit imagineNigeria.ng today. today.